Hello everybody and welcome to Build It Week with Be The Scientist. So this week we're going to talk all about building things. That's an area of STEM called engineering and it involves a lot of math too. So we have two amazing books we're going to read, one great poem, and one experiment that we're going to do. So it is going to be a full and busy week today. So write in the comments if you are here and you're watching. Uh, it looks like actually it just started over. So maybe people are only seeing me just now. So if uh, it really did just start, my apologies. I've been talking to myself. Welcome to Build It Week with B. Uh, write in the comments if you are here, you're watching, so that I know everything is working correctly. I'm going to get Instagram live up while um, we're waiting for everybody to log in. Um, oh, good. I'm so glad that my friends, the Oldhams, are here. Now, for anyone that is a private client, you're going to be seeing a repeat. Now, if you want to do some private sessions with me, I do a lot of testing for my story time hour. So if you want to see some of the stuff before it goes live or even see things that I'll never do live, um, you can contact me at the link below. Uh, we're going to do a week all about building and it's called architecture. Architecture is a really fun area of engineering that involves math and science. And it's a really fun place where they intersect. So, all right, we're going live on Instagram. We are live on Facebook. And we are ready to get started. We have two books. We're going to be reading Roberto, The Insect Architects. And we'll also be reading The Marshmallow Incident. Now, I will say that right before this started, I found a roach this big. It's dead. I found it already dead, but I'm freaking out about it and I'm keeping my eye on it. So if you see me looking this way, it's me making sure that that roach is still dead. So I will be calling my landlord after this is over. <laughs> All right, let's get started. We're gonna start with Roberto, the insect architect. So let me make sure I'm not giving anything away here before I share my screen. Excellent. Okay, now I actually haven't read this one all the way through before, but just paging through it, it looked like it would be really fun. So we're gonna give it a try. And of course, it is very fitting after the friend that I just found. Roberto, the insect architect. And for those of you joining me on Instagram, if you'd like to see the pictures, uh, join us on Facebook Live. Roberto, the insect architect by Nina Layden. Even when Roberto was little, he went against the grain. Like most termites, he melted over maple and pined for pine. Oak was okay too, but Roberto didn't let, uh, didn't eat his food. He played with it. You're wasting a good meal, his mother said. Don't you know that there are termites starving in Antarctica? But Roberto didn't answer. He was busy daydreaming about becoming a famous architect. And remember, architect is when we build things. So those are people that build buildings or public structures. Whoever heard of a termite who wanted to be an architect, the other termite snickered. Roberto, you should be a chef. But Roberto didn't want to cook. He wanted to build. Hungry to start a new life, Roberto realized that he had to leave. So Roberto packed his bags and took the train to Bug Central Station in the busy, buzzing hive of the big city. The city was a place where you could build your dreams. It was a place where you would be accepted, and it was a place where the other termites wouldn't bug you. Roberto beamed hope like a lit up skyscraper. 
Wow, look at all the different kinds of insects on the page. And I think I even spot a few bumblebees up here. But hope didn't come cheap in the big city. Neither did a place to live. Roberto had no choice but to rent a room in a flea bag hotel run by a nervous tick. He shared the room with a family of bed bugs. Roberto introduced himself. Then he built the bed bugs their very own beds. Wow, that is so nice. After a good night's sleep, Roberto began to look for work as an architect, but things didn't go very well. Show me what you've done, said the architect, Hank Floyd might. There are no termites in my houses, stated Fleas van der Rohe. I'm busy, Antonia Gowdy blurted out. Don't bug me. Getting a job is hard. As Roberto crawled home, feeling like a pest, he was sideswiped by a fly. Watch where you're going, he mumbled. The fly started to cry, but... I don't have any place to go, she lamented. Roberto wanted to com comfort her, but he was nearly nailed by a carpenter ant trying to fix a rickety shed. Then, out of nowhere, Roberto was almost run over by a stampede of roaches being chased from a diner. And suddenly, a frantic ladybug flew into his arms. My house is on fire and my children are gone, the ladybug cried. Roberto could see that he wasn't the only bug with problems. In fact, his problems didn't seem so big after all. Roberto wished that he could do something for the others, but what could one termite do? A lot of damage, Fleas van der Rohe had told him. I'll show old fleas what this termite can do. I'll show them all. Back at the hotel, Roberto came up with a plan. First, he drew up some blueprints. He sketched houses and streets. He sketched stores and playgrounds. By the time he was finished, he had sketched an entire neighborhood. Now, I just need to find a good location. And what he's sketching up here and drawing are called blueprints. And when you draw something before you build it, that's called a blueprint even if it's not in blue. Roberto searched all over the city for the perfect site. He finally found an abandoned, run-down block of crumbling buildings. It was a total mess. There were piles of old wood and garbage everywhere. It was just what he was looking for. And look at all these things. Can anyone spy something interesting in this pile of garbage? I spy a toilet a shoe, and a toaster oven. What do you spy? Ooh, that's interesting. I didn't notice the basketball. Roberto hammered and nailed. He sawed and sanded. He worked day and night. Like a magician, he transformed the block of junk into a street of extraordinary homes. Each one was a work of art. But Roberto didn't sign his artwork. Instead, he anonymously sent the keys to the new owners. Then he rolled up his plans and went home. And when we do something anonymously, that means that we don't tell them who it was. So he didn't say that it was from Roberto. He just sent keys to those people that needed it. Some very surprised bugs went home too. Tutor the fly with no place to go buzzed with delight. I'm a housefly again, she declared. Then Grant, the carpenter ant, arrived. He dropped his tool belt on the porch. Now I can have a real workshop, he beamed. The roaches were the next ones on the scene. You won't find us sleeping in salads anymore, <laughs> they rejoiced. Finally, Dottie the ladybug and her children moved into their new lair. It's perfect, she sighed. It's fireproof. Wow, look at all the things that Roberto is building with. He built with rulers, he used screws, he used forks and spoons. What else do we notice that he used to build with? Looks like some scrap material. 
and a salt and a pepper shaker. Wow, that's so creative. I love doing crafts with things that I found find around the house. Quickly, word spread. Soon, everyone wanted to know who built these amazing abodes. Abodes are another word for homes. Rumors were flying. Antenna were buzzing. Barbara Waterbugs wanted an exclusive interview. Robin Leach promised to make the builder rich and famous. Stephen Shieldbug wanted the movie rights. Diane Spider searched the World Wide Web for the scoop. And the Insect Inquirer offered a reward to the first bug who brought the builder to light. So everyone wants to know the mystery of what bug built these amazing homes. And I'm keeping an eye on my dead bug over there, making sure that it really is dead. All day long, bounty hunting butterflies took wing, paper wasps swarmed the streets, bold weevils crawled out of the woodwork, but late at night, a click beetle got the shot. The next morning, headlines screamed in the news, termite chips, new homes out of old blocks says the insect inquirer. It's Roberto, Tudor hummed. He's our hero. Overnight, Roberto became the talk of the town. Architects offered him jobs. Book publishers wanted his story. Ladybug sent him love letters and his bug buddies threw him a big bash. At the height of the party, the mayor unveiled a statue of Roberto to be placed in the city park. Wow, look at that statue, Roberto the insect art architect. And in his, all of his hands, he's got a protractor, he's got a ruler, he's got a hammer, and maybe some sort of a pipe there. Wow, so interesting. I even have some protractor earrings in and some little gears to celebrate Build It Week. Roberto built his dream. He opened his own company and became the most famous architect in the insect world. Students studied him in school. Some of his houses even became museums. And this one is called the Wingfly Museum. But best of all, when little termites play with their food, now their parents say, be creative. Maybe someday you'll grow up to be just like Roberto. And the newspaper says, extra, Roberto builds first house on Mars. Wow, I wonder what it took to get a termite up to Mars. The end. Wow, that was a really good story. I love that Roberto followed his dreams, even though all the termites said that termites can't build things. So if you want to do something, Anything that you can dream of, now is the time to make those blueprints, draw those plans up, and make your dreams become a reality. So now we have Roberto, the insect architect, and now we're going to read The Marshmallow Incident. This has been a favorite among my private sessions because it's a really silly story that has some real life connections to it. Then I'm going to teach you how to make your very own marshmallow or anything shooter. So without further ado, let's check out the marshmallow incident. The marshmallow incident written by Judy Barrett and illustrated by Ron Barrett. This is from the same creators of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, one of my personal favorites. And I actually remember reading Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs to my little sister um, when she was much younger. So that's a fun memory. And I'm gonna see if I can get this slightly bigger without blocking myself out too much. Okay, so here we go, the marshmallow incident. There's a lot of fun things to notice um, on this storybook. So keep your eyes peeled. 
the marshmallow incident. Oh, I forgot how small this print is. I think we're gonna have to make the story a little bit smaller so that I can get a little closer. Okay, there we go. The marshmallow incident occurred a very long time ago, so long ago that most people have forgotten why it happened in the first place. Fortunately, the true story was recorded in a diary that was found in the ruins of an ancient castle, hidden in an old and stale box of marshmallows. The diary tells the story of two neighboring towns, the town of left and the town of right. They were named that way because everyone who lived in the town of left was left-handed and everyone who lived in the town of right was right-handed and it had been that way for endless generations. The difference seemed so extreme to the people of left and right that they refused to have anything to do with each other. It didn't help that someone had painted a bright yellow dotted line between the two towns. The people didn't know who had done it or why, but they never trespassed on or over the line. And there's some really fun signs here. It says, lefties, we proudly serve leftovers. Righties, go right home. Right is wrong. So that's on the lefties side of the town. And on the right side of the town, it says, right is right. Uh, left is left behind, the right stuff, and always the right time. Both towns were watched over by the order of the ambidextrous. Whoa, ambidextrous. Can you say that with me? Ambidextrous. Ambidextrous means that you can use both hands equally as well. So when we talk about right-handed and left-handed, what we mean is that writing and uh, playing and doing things around the house is easier with your right hand. If you're left-handed, you do things around the house, you write and play mostly with your left hand leading. So ambidextrous means they can use both hands, which is pretty rare. So anyway, uh, both towns were watched over by the order of the ambidextrous knights of the dotted yellow line who lived in a small castle right smack in the middle of that dotted yellow line and whose sole mission in life was to make sure that nobody crossed the dotted yellow line. They kept the line neat and clean, repainted it when it started to fade and guarded it really well. And the signs here say, lefties, stay back. Stop. Lefties, go no further. And on the other side, it says, righties, stay back. Go right home. You're way too close. The knights also guarded something else really well. Their marshmallows. A few years earlier, one of the knights had entered a poetry contest and won first prize, which just so happened to be 50,000 boxes of marshmallows. That was an awful lot of marshmallows. When they were delivered to the castle, the knights stacked them up high inside their front gates. And what was that marshmallow winning poem, you might ask? Well, it shows it right here. Roses are red, violets are blue. I like marshmallows because they're made of sticky glue. And that won 50,000 marshmallows. And there's some funny things that I noticed here in the crowd. I noticed that there is a horse here watching and a guy with a really flat hat. Kind of looks like a pizza, maybe. And someone with a foam finger. He's number one. So what are they going to do with all these marshmallows anyway? I don't know. The knights snacked on them, ate them with peanut butter, melted them on baked potatoes, put them on pizza, spun them into fluff, fed them to their horses as special treats, floated them in their hot cocoa, and roasted them. And I always laugh looking at this illustration of the knight roasting his marshmallow with the dragon's breath. And you might also notice that the little feather burnt off too. 
One sunny June day, the town of Wright was having its annual picnic, complete with soup and biscuits. And there's a lot of fun happening here on the Wright yard, and this kite says Wright Kite. Kids were running around and climbing up and down the trees and on top of the stone walls. They were getting very close to that dotted yellow line, so someone went running after them to keep them away from it. Uh-oh. Before he knew it, he tripped on a rock, went flying over the line, and landed in the town of Left. He knew there was going to be trouble, and there certainly was. Oh, no. Does anyone notice the rock that he tripped on and the dog that's trying to help keep him from going over the line? Looks like it didn't work. His flat hat flew off and everyone is watching in horror. When the knights saw what happened, they immediately whipped themselves into a frenzy. The line had been crossed. Since it had never happened before, they shouted orders to one another to mount their horses and grab their nearest ammunition, which, oddly enough, turned out to be marshmallows. The knights strapped several boxes of marshmallows onto their horses and swarmed out of the castle in a major tizzy to do their nightly duty and defend the dotted yellow line. Galloping around, they filled their catapults and fired thousands of marshmallows into the air. Birds caught hold of them in flight and people ran for shelter. Wow, there is so much happening on every page with the illustrations, but to make sure that we have time for our experiment, I'm going to keep moving. But remember, you can always hit that pause button, the two lines um, that are right next to each other when you hover your mouse over my image. You can hit pause, make all the observations you'd like, and then join us again. After just a few minutes, it looked as if there had been a blizzard. The countryside was littered white with marshmallows. The marshmallows gently bounced off houses and heads, rolled down hills, floated um, oops, lost my place. Floated across the lake, got stuck in trees, and amused and confused the cows. The attack continued until one of the knights realized how silly this whole thing was. He climbed on top of a large pile of marshmallows, raised his hands high in the air, and yelled, Why do we have this line? It's been here for years and years, but it seems to create problems instead of solving them. Let's wipe it out. Not so fast, the townspeople shouted back. This calls for a town meeting of both towns. Later that afternoon, the townspeople met. The knights stood by to keep the peace. In the end, no one could come up with a truly sensible reason to keep the line. So they decided they should and would get rid of it. And some of the conversations happening are, those dots bother my eyes. I like the line, yellow is a cheery color. I think we should think about it. Let us vote. We need the line. We live next door to each other, and we don't even know each other. We've always had the line. Why change now? It's silly. I like dotted lines. No more line, shouted the townspeople as they danced around in celebration. And they're all chanting, no more lines, no more lines. And some of the other things people are saying, uh, no more clotheslines? I think she misheard that. I won't miss it. No more lines. The line will finally be gone. It's about time. I can't wait to get rid of it. No more lines. I won't miss it. Then, for the first time ever, the townspeople crossed over the line and introduced themselves. They even shook hands and chatted. What's your name? I've never been to the town of left. I've never been to the town of right. It's nice to meet you. I feel better already. And look, there's even a cat and a dog meeting each other. 
Everyone had a good time playing with the marshmallows. They made finger puppets out of them and invented games like Tic Tac Marshmallow and Base Marshmallow. People painted with them, slept on them, and turned them into sculptures. Someone even built a small version of the pyramids. Can anyone else hear that car alarm going off? Someone needs to take care of it. That night, all the people from the towns of left and right roasted marshmallows over a huge roaring campfire. The knights and their horses were there too. Everyone sat in a circle and sang their favorite songs while munching on the delicious gooey treats. And this little station says, make your s'mores here. Has anyone else ever had a s'more? It's one of my favorite summer treats. You get a graham cracker, some chocolate, and then you roast a marshmallow so it's nice and warm. And when you put it on top, it melts everything, making it so gooey and delicious. I like mine a little bit burnt. The next day, using mops, brushes, soap, and water, all the townspeople joined together and happily removed the old dotted yellow line. They rubbed at it and scrubbed at it until the line was completely gone. In time, all the marshmallows disappeared. The rains melted them and washed them away. And because marshmallows are made predominantly of sugar, they do disappear really quickly. If you've ever held a marshmallow in your mouth, it starts to dissolve. The same thing will happen here. And we can see that they've attached scrub brushes to their feet. And even this guy is uh, doing a handstand. That's how my parents clean their house. I don't know about you. And every year after that, on the anniversary of the marshmallow incident, the towns of left and the towns of right held a campfire. The knights always supplied a sensible number of marshmallows for the townspeople to roast, and everyone continued to live peacefully and sweetly ever after. Good night. The end. Wow, that was another really great story. I love the town of left and the town of right because it kind of reminds me of today in our country. We have people who believe two separate things, but I think that we can come together, we can get rid and erase that um, yellow dotted line in the middle of our country, and we can work together to solve our pandemic. Okay, now is the most exciting part. Now, I don't have marshmallows that are quite the right size. I only have really tiny ones because I accidentally bought cereal that had marshmallows in it, so I picked all of them out. But instead, we're going to be using these ping pong balls as marshmallows for our launcher. This is what it's going to look like when it's all finished. And if you want to see the instructions uh, for your grown-ups to help you build this, it is in the description box of the Facebook Live event on Scientific American. What you're going to need is some toilet paper tubes. You can also use um, a big paper towel tube and cut it up. So that's what I did. I cut a few apart. Now, the first one, you're going to cut down this line so that you can make it slightly smaller. And I'm going to deconstruct mine so that I can show you. So I cut it right down the middle and then I retaped it so that it would be smaller than the regular sized one. Then I put a nice big piece of packing tape just like that. And you took a pencil or instead of a pencil, you can use some sort of uh, chopstick or um, uh, any kind of skewer, something like that. And you're going to make a hole and put it straight through just like this. This is going to be how we're going to aim our launcher. Then we're going to slide our smaller tube into our larger tube, just like this. Then I made two tiny slits on each side and I put a rubber band in it. Now, 
I tried doing this with some of my, the families I've been working with, with hair ties. Hair ties don't seem to be elastic enough. So if you have rubber bands like this, that's gonna be the best idea. Once I put the rubber bands in, it was also pretty important that I put a little piece of tape over it to make sure that it didn't rip. Then once I got to this point, I put the rubber bands around my pencil or skewer. Now I can pull down just like this and let go. So how you wanna hold this when you're shooting it is you're going to hold the paper tube underneath the rubber bands, that's important. So the rubber bands are over your hands. Then you can try this with your whole hand. I like using two fingers, but it depends on how big your contraption is and how small your fingers are. You can take your fingers and put them right on the pencil, just like this. And when you pull it back, we're amassing a bunch of potential energy, just like rubber bands always collect. And when I let go, then that little tiny tube is going to push closer to the front. So let's see how it works. I'm gonna scooch this back a little bit so that I have some room. I put my marshmallow or my ping pong ball on top. And when I pull this down, all of a sudden we can't see that ball anymore, but when I let it go, it flies up into the air. So now I made my marshmallow launcher. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so this has been a lot of fun. I've been chasing these around my apartment for a few weeks now, but try to make one of these. Then you can do different kinds of competitions. Like how do you make the ball go a shorter distance or how do you make it go a really far distance? So this is my marshmallow shooter. I can't wait to see what yours looks like. So when you make yours, send it to me by posting on any of my social media pages or sending me an email. And to finish today's stream, um, I wanted to read a really short poem from Shel Silverstein. I just got this in the mail. I have loved Shel Silverstein when I was growing up, but somehow across some of the years, this, is, this third book I lost, Where the Sidewalk Ends. And I found a really cool story that reminded me of Roberto, the architect. And it's called One Inch Tall. And this is the picture. In these poem books, there's usually just one little illustration for each of the stories. If you were only one inch tall, you'd ride a worm to school. The teardrop of a crying ant would be your swimming pool. A crumb of cake would be a feast at, and, last you, and last you seven days at least. A flea would be a frightening beast if you were one inch tall. If you were only one inch tall, you'd walk beneath the door and it would take about a month to get down to the store. A bit of fluff would be your bed. Hey, like the marshmallows. You'd swing upon a spider's thread and wear a thimble on your head if you were one inch tall. You'd surf across the kitchen sink upon a stick of gum. You couldn't hug your mama. You'd just have to hug her thumb. You'd run from people's feet in fright. To move a pen would take all night. This poem took 14 years to write because I'm just one inch tall. By Shel Silverstein. His poems are always so silly and there's a poem for every occasion. So before we sign off and sing our goodbye song, I just wanted to thank everybody for hanging out with me for so long. I can't wait to continue growing science story time with B, and I've met so many really fun friends through it. So if you learned anything new by watching today's stream, you're excited for Build It Week, or you just feel generous, it would be so nice of you to contribute to either my PayPal or my Venmo. It is not expected, but it is appreciated for this laid off educator. You can also find additional resources on my website, bethescientist.com, and my link tree, which is in my Instagram bio. So now it's time for the goodbye song. Before I start singing, I always realize halfway through that I've never really taught you all how to make the percussion noises. 
Percussion means when we beat on something and we use the vibration as the uh, sound. So in the middle of the song, and now it's time to say goodbye. I go kind of fast, so let's slow that down. The first thing we do is we rub our hands together. We feel that friction. Remember we talked about friction a few weeks ago? And that's when we can feel the warmth in our hands. So there's science concept for everything. We're gonna rub our hands, then we clap, and then we snap. And if you don't know how to snap, then you can just kind of move your fingers around. Snapping also uses friction in order to make a sound. Okay, so now that you know how to do it with me, let's sing our goodbye song. So long, farewell to you, my friends. Goodbye for now until we meet again. So long, farewell to you, my friends. S goodbye for now until we meet again. It's been great to play and sing together in the hive, but now it's time to say goodbye. So long, farewell to you, my friends. Goodbye for now until we meet again. Bye, everybody. Join us back for Build It Week with B on Wednesday and Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So long.